check. Mythology. Part of our mythology. Mythology. Wait. How's the jingle go? Mythology. Part of the mythology. No apology. <laughs> If today's stream is too long or too short. Is that how it goes? That's how it goes. Hi, everybody. Am I on? All right. Ready to go. We're on. Hear you, your jingle. Mythology. Part of our mythology. All right, I guess we'll get this started. We'll get the party started. Welcome everyone to today's stream. We are continuing with our 5.0 course today. And this is the start of a new module. We did the ethics module, which was first, I'll click over to my, to my screen over here. We did, we are in the process of building the course, right? So these are all going to be turned into question and test format. But all of you that are live today um, get to be involved in the building of it. So this is our 5.0 version of Ethology, which I love Ethology. And I promise you, this is where it's at. Ethology is where it's at. I mean, the whole course is important, but if you really know your ethology, you are truly going to be a canine behavior expert. Do not skimp on this. It's probably the most information is an ethology that you have to learn in the course. And, but if you know it, yes, it's going to help you to be able to troubleshoot and understand. You really want to be able to understand, especially the behavioral problems that you're called upon to help people out with. So I'm excited to get started with this unit. Although this first intro to ethology was kind of tricky for me because I was looking back at the 4.0 course and I want to go more in depth that I went into in the 4.0 course and the 4.0 course first intro steam was kind of long despite all the ferrets running around in the in the course and the the difficulties of, of just starting to do live streaming the intro was a bit long and I have stuff I want to add to it so what's going to happen today is I'm going to give you an intro and then I'm going to give you some further information that I encourage you to get a head start on and look at on your own. But then we're going to return in other streams and go a little bit more into the recommend the recommend I can't talk today. The recommended reading at the end of the unit. So without further ado, let's. Uh, Let's get started here. Um, what does Art say? I'm gonna teach Hudson the puppy to sing it as part of my training plan. I'm a horrible singer. All right. Um, all right, so this is what we're gonna to learn today. We're gonna to learn what is ethology, and I'm going to explain why ethics is an important prerequisite to use an ethology and foundation style dog training. And I believe overall for the dog training industry, um, I want to refer back to how this connects in our storyline, basically about how ABA and ethology are related. And then we're gonna talk about some of the significant contributors that we're gonna be referring to in in this course, so then I'm going to give you some some further reading that will help prepare you moving forward in this section. 
So, for starters, I'm going to bounce around my, my note page here, is simply, what is ethology? Right? What is ethology? Let's go to my little PowerPoint over here, right? And so I modified our 4.01 our, our 4 to, to trim the fat off of it a bit here. Um, ethology is the scientific and objective study of behavior, usually with a focus on behavior under natural conditions and viewing behavior as an evolutionarily adaptive trait. It is objective. It is not influenced by personal feelings or options in considering and representing the facts. All right. Conrad Lorenz is known as the father of ethology who we're going to speak about. Now, so ethology, we're going to, in a nutshell, it really is understanding the natural behavior of animals. And we touched upon this in the, in the earlier units, that training is much more than just giving consequences to an animal, right? Inside of a controlled environment, inside of a laboratory. We really need to understand the natural behavior of the animal in order to succeed. Now, the reason why we have ethics, why I put ethics below ethology in this course, and I hope this, I believe this is going to be even more, become more clear after you start going through the, the ethology portion of this course, is that if someone does not have good ethics and is not honest in particular, it can skew the information that we put out and how we deal with our dog training. And it could just stop us directly in our tracks. The, in, the, in, the, in the unit about ethics in particular, the dog training, the dog training ethics and, and dog training, there was, I had um, the videos about how in particular dominance, the whole, the whole issue, the whole behavior of dominance in dog training has really been attacked mostly for commercial purposes, which can lead to, which it's going to be clarified. I'd say like there's, there's, you get a broad sense in that unit. I give an introduction about how that can be an issue in dog training, but you're going to see more why this can definitely be an issue as we go through this unit and cause, um, total failure in dog training plans, right? In dog training plans, which can cause injury to the dogs, to people, to the, to, to, to personal property, all kinds of things. So we do not want to skew the, the ethical side of things in our plans because then we just cannot be honest about ethology and we need ethology in our dog training plans. Now, what I also did over here is I put, um, is we talked about um, ABA and um, ABA applied behavior analysis and how our dog training plans should follow the, the principles of ABA and we're going to be most, we're going to be most successful. And we also talked about how ethology definitely must be a component of ABA. And we are at this time, we're only like a generation into this where, where ABA has, has hit, has, has, is something that is being done publicly and professionals are, are using ABA. It's a brand new thing. And we're just one generation away too. This is all recent, uh, ethology as a science, which is animal behavior. And what is cool is we've been witnessing, you know, we've been witnessing history just within the past generation. And I put in, I put a video over here with um, Marion Bailey, 
where she does talk about, and I put some of the markers where you could just see some of the source information. Where remember, she was a student of B.F. Skinner, who was primarily a he was primarily a scientist. He did not come out of the lab often or out of the, the, the teaching environment. One of the, the biggest um, examples of when he did was when he went to go work on the project using the pigeons as a guidance system for guiding bombs during World War II. And what is cool with this interview of Marion Bailey is she does talk about, we're not, I don't have, we're not going to go through this right now, but this is just reference. It was interesting how she talks about at about the 17 minute mark is she does talk about when they went out of the laboratory and B.F. Skinner decided he wanted to use crows at first to guide the, to guide the bombs because he, he, he heard stories about their intelligence and they even met a crow that was a pet that was very intelligent. So he's very confident that these would be a good choice. But however, they did not know much about the ethology of crows and the fact that it is very important about who the crows imprint with. Um, they started off the training with crows, a pair of crows that were basically just more bonded with each other and not to the researchers. And they were very difficult to train. And, and Marion Bailey says in retrospect, if she knew more about ethology, that um, it could have saved them a lot of time and effort. There's also reference to, um, she talks about her article, The Misbehavior of, organ of Organisms, which to save you some time, if you didn't want, I mean, the whole interview was great. If you just want to know more about the history of where we came from as a pr pr profession, um, the whole interview is really great, but about the one hour and 15 minute and 30 second mark, um, she talks about the misbehavior of organisms, which again, we touched upon that in the earlier, in the earlier streams, which is about, uh, primarily about, she's talking about the instinctual drift and the evolutionary c contingencies that it's very important that we're basically choosing the right animal for the job that naturally is more likely to do the behaviors and that we can get instinctual drift that that can override um, override what we're teaching the the animal so it helps tie this together why the ethology is going to be so important um, now the the um, most over here, what I put down is um, significant contributors. Now, ethology, Conrad Lorenz is considered the father of ethology. And again, this is not that long ago. He was doing, I mean, he passed away in 1989 and he was very prolific ethologist. And although there was other studies of animals going on like he is f by far the most well-known and one of the greatest contributors early contributors of ethology and he is known um a lot for his work with with birds and and uh and geese and and how they can imprint to the first person that they see and the importance of how, you know, of, of how this shapes their behavior, that we have to understand animal behavior in order really to, to do anything with them. Um, he, so he was very, very important. Um, some things over here about Conrad that I put down, some significant things that I thought were interesting as I put down. Um, in order to understand the mechanisms of animal behavior, it was necessary to observe their full range of behaviors in their natural context. All right, so he was one of the first persons to really do this. He also says, he argued that animals have an inner drive to carry out instinctive behaviors, and that if they do not encounter the right stimulus, they will eventually engage in the behavior with an, with an inappropriate stimulus. 
in his case, you know, he, um, the obvious one with him is when, like, the geese did not encounter their own parents, they would then engage with the behavior with a human. But this is significant to us also as dog trainers, the ethology, because a lot of behaviors, we're, we're often contacted to help um, change behaviors or, or stop behaviors that are causing problems for the family of a dog. And nine out of 10 times, whatever behavior that needs to be stopped, um, we can relate it to it being an outlet for something else that they would naturally be doing, right? That a canine would naturally be doing and they're just doing it to an inappropriate stimulus. So quick examples are things like, um, Puppies chewing things are not supposed to, chasing after our ankles and bite, biting our ankles, chasing after the, the cat, um, 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 herding animals, um, again, herding and chasing things that they're not supposed to, hunting breeds. So, I mean, dogs were really dogs that we work with is we domesticated them mostly to take advantage of their some sort of modification of their aggressive tendencies, if you really think about it. And we've been using them to guard, to herd, to hunt, to kill things when we're talking about terriers. So if we don't have outlets, most human families, most families when they have their dogs really do not have the appropriate outlet for their dogs. So therefore we have jobs as dog trainers. He also believed that animals were capable of experiencing many of the same emotions as humans. So he's known for that. And you hear a lot. And I like this because this was early on. And, and, and Conrad Lorenz spent, there is lots of like cool old footage of him. I actually embedded one into this, into this presentation. Um, I have another one that I could share too. Um, but I find that quote interesting because you do hear, you do hear even today about be careful not to do anthropomorphism with dogs, which is given human-like characteristics to something that's not human, like the, the dog. And in some cases, that could be true, which will go on further in the course, right? Where we, and that's mostly because we're misinterpreting with animals do by trying to judge the behavior by why we would be doing that. A common one is something like spite. That's the one that off the top of my head that comes to mind where, where a dog pees on the floor, chews, chews on something when the owner's not home and the owner say, Oh, the, he did that out of spite because he didn't want to be left there, which that's not true or that that's just simply not, not true. And we go into that further along the along the course but a lot of the very primitive things like emotions emotions are 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 primitive all right they if you think about it um things like i mean some obvious ones like um feelings that we have and you know things like hunger and 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 thirst and the avoidance of pain and seeking, you know, seeking warmth and things like that. Those should seem pretty obvious, but emotions like even fear, right? You can get down to very simple animals, bugs, all right? And they understand fear. I mean, they understand fear. It, it, was, it was something way, way back in our evolutionary history that we needed to understand these things in order to survive. But then you could watch so many animals, very primitive animals, when it comes down to even things like the way that they protect their young. I could pull up videos right now that will show like a rat protecting its babies against a snake, something it would normally be running away from. And, and all kinds of like little animals risking their lives because they feel love for their offspring. And you will also see humans. There was a story not too long ago about a mother who protected her daughter from a tiger. The mother ended up dying, but 
a lot of these things that animals do and a lot of the emotions that they have, we share with them, all right? We're just, we're evolved in different ways, but remember, we're, we're mostly the same. And they're not just robots that we train in a laboratory. We have to consider these things. Um, now, over here, which I found, I found this clip pretty significant. This was a clip um, on on YouTube that not a whole, there's actually a, like, a, I think there's like a little 15 minute thing about Conrad Moe's work with work with birds and his with geese and his in his later years looks like he's doing some sort of workshop and continuing his his studies with some with some students but i found this part interesting interesting too i'm just going to play the clip it's only about about one minute conrad lawrence's studies of animals have provided new insights into the behavior of the highest animal of all man it is the theory of Conrad Lawrence that rank order in animal societies seems to reduce the amount of fighting for food, mating partners, and other essentials of survival. Without rank, without a pecking order, there would be continuous fighting within a species. Soon all the energy of that species would be exhausted by perpetual quarrels among its own kind. It would be doomed, unable to survive, in the deadly competition for food and living space with others. Rank order seems to prevent future quarrels by making the individual remember the lesson of one original fight. Okay. So, one of these, one, um, one of the things that, that stuck out to me with Conrad Lorenz is, you know, especially further along in his in his career he all he, all these different animals that he studied there is definitely um, there is some focus on quite a bit of focus on aggression and the purpose of aggression um, and dominance that it is there to prevent aggression and it's not only with just about every animal that he studied, it's even with humans. He would relate it to humans. And he would even, um, his Wikipedia article, I, I should have put the put a link to it. It's pretty good if you want like a good history of, of Conrad Lorenz. There's a, there's a nice big quote about how he speaks about if aliens were watching us from Mars, right? And they just had a telescope enough to see like our movements around the globe and us fighting in wars that we're an animal, you know, we have um, wars and things like this is like, we are, we are animals, right? We are animals and, and we can learn a lot about ourselves by studying animals. But, but the significance of this, why I put this in here is all right. Dogs, which we're studying, they're just one of many species that share a lot in common. And the issue of dominance, which unfortunately we would have to focus on dominance anyway as dog trainers, but we have to put extra emphasis on it because it was recently attacked for, I would say, in my opinion, commercial reasons or unethical reasons. And as a dog trainer trying to get information, you're going to need to know how to get to the source of information to make your own judgments, judgments about things. Because unless you can get to the source information, there's a lot of skewed stuff out there. So that's why I want you to know where all of this began. Know where this all began and then being able to follow along so when you read modern information, you can backtrack and you know, you know the source information. If you know the source information, then you'll know what is the, you'll know what is objective and ethical and what is, what is skewed, what is skewed, right. which, um, whoops, change my page here, which is going to bring us to, um, we are going to look into 
the wolf early in this course. So we're here for dog training. We're here for dog training. Why do we have to study wolf behavior when we're, when we're, when we're learning about a dog? And the reason is that our dogs are, they are the domesticated version of the wolf. Technically, they're subspecies of the same species. Like genetically, they can interbreed with each other. Um, you will even deal with, a lot of you will deal with owners that even have hybrids that you're going to be the expert that's going to be called upon to help them out. And sometimes you may even encounter someone who does have a wolf that you may elect to help to, to help out. Um, it's all within, I believe it's within the scope of a professional, as long as it's legal in, in your area to be able to help anyone with a canine if it's in their home if you have to if you consider you know the the local laws and, and all and all of these things but domesticated dogs are their wild counterpart is the wolf so if you are studying any type of behavior and trying to get to the source of why an animal acts the way it does if it's domesticated it doesn't matter if we're talking about chickens or, or cows or horses, it is what is done in science is to look at the natural behavior of their wild counterparts because we have moved them into much more of an artificial environment compared to where the vast majority of their evolution happened. Now, dogs have changed significantly within pretty recent history um, but you still have to look, if you go to the blueprint where they all came from, it is the best way to explain the differences we're going to see in all the different breeds, which it's going to be very hard to explain the behavior if you limit yourself to just information that's based on domestic dogs being kept as pets. So we want to study the wolf, and I promise you, I promise you, there is a gold mine of information that I'm going to help you to decipher if you read some of the studies that I suggest. And it's going to save you lots of time because there are mountains of studies about canines out there. But I'm going to show you the most important ones to look at, which is going to make all the difference in the world and i'm speaking from experience from me and other trainers have studied these particular studies in particular that it's just going to clarify so much about what's going on in homes that have dogs so what we got here these are ones that we're going to be talking about not all today all right we're not doing this today because it's just going to be too long we're going to break it up we're going to um, break it up but i want you to be prepared one is rudolf Schenkel, and he had a famous study expression expression studies of wolves that he did in 1947 um and he studied captive wolves in Switzerland. In, in Switzerland, And what happened here, it was a bunch of wolves that were accumulated from different areas, even of different subspecies. I think I believe there were gray wolves and smaller red wolves that were thrown together in a pretty small enclosure. And he studied them. And it's the first known use of the word alpha when it comes to ethology or or definitely when it comes to to canines um and it was the first up close study of wolf expressions and sociology and it is considered outdated by by many so this study from rudolf Schenkel was 
remember this is this is in 1947 this is the beginning of ethology there was almost nothing known about the behavior of wolves it was just shrouded in mystery during this time now his study is based off you got to take it i'm going to have links to this stuff right you can get a head start on it but this is going to be too much information i'd expect anyone to just absorb at once um, especially if i don't point out the significance of some of these things in the study but i want to give it to you so you could dive into it right i like you to have the source information so you can get into the habit of having your own opinion about things now ethology is objective and i believe Rod rudolf Schenkel's study was very objective and when he was assuming things he made it known and he was i believe he was very fair about mentioning the limitations of his study. Um, so it is, and this we have to take into consideration, it was a study based off of captive wolves, unrelated, put in a small environment. This is going, this information is important because even though it is not the natural environment of a wolf, it does give us significant information about placing canines in an unnatural environment. And it mimics very closely what you will encounter as a dog trainer with unknown dogs coming together and being trapped in a home, in an apartment. Um, so it's significant, it is significant. And this particular study has been um, has been basically in the United States at least almost wiped off of it's it's wiped out of existence. You cannot even find it. The only copy I was actually able to find one copy broken in pieces. David, which we're going to go into David Meech's website. Um, hidden on his website in like f five or six different files, which I had to like upload them. I, I downloaded them, connected them, put them together in one file. And since it's not something that was copyright protected, I uploaded it into, I think the site is called archive.com. You'll be able to see it, um, to put it out there public just to get it out there. Because every, so many people trash the study, but not a lot of people actually read it. And it was not even readily available for people to read. So I'm very proud. That's one thing I'm proud of, that I was able to find the only copy I can find in David Meech's website, broken up, sort of out of date format, and I was able to embed it. To make it easier for people to find but we're gonna go off it go we're gonna have to talk about rudolf shankles shankles work all right and and the things he's the things that he did was very significant um almost you got to think this guy spent years years if someone's spending years observing the expressions right it was just about the expressions of the wolves he was not making the study anything other than what it was supposed to be about these movements that they do these postures how they express themselves that his work is a gift um, his work is a gift that he was able to look at these things record these things and objectively be able to explain what situations we would see these different types of body postures all right including the tail there's endless things that go on with the tail and the body postures and things like this. This was a gift to us all. And his work, his illustrations are one of the most copied. They, they are, for sure they are. If you have a book on canine, on canine body language, the illustrations were either directly taken from Shankel's work or copied you know they were you know made their own illustrations based off of this stuff 
very important. So we're talking about the, the body, the body postures, the tails, the facial expressions, super important. Um, and yes, I read what you're saying, um, or yes, definitely. Um, we're going to go into that. Art is talking about somewhere on the web, there's an article where Meech expresses regret about the way his views on dominance have been misinterpreted, misrepresenting, uh, misrepresented. Misrepre Definitely. I may have the link somewhere, somewhere too, which brings us to, to David, David Meech is, um, David Meech is also significant. The reason why he is very significant is he has hundreds of publications on wolves. And most importantly, his studies on wolves are the most in-depth that involve watching them in their natural environment. So, so this is going to be a huge difference and very significant. So we're going to go into his studies and there is just a wealth of information in there. Unfortunately, and it seems as if David Meech um, regretted it afterwards, according to some different quotes that we have from him, um, that we that we can find them. I believe I have a quote from him somewhere in, in one of the links that I have, is what happens with, um, is with David Meech. Now, you got to remember, this guy, he is a c conservationist, too, and... Um, he was also trying to remember the wolf had a portrayal of like this um, of this animal that a lot of people did not like the wolf. All right. They associated the wolves with like killing farm animals and they were very mysterious. And there's lots of, you know, and all, all these all this, you know, in, in all types of folklore. I mean, let's go over like you know, Little Red Riding Hood and the Big Bad Wolf and. Wolves were not thought of in a really good good light, and they were they were they were basic they were hunted out of existence for the most part in the United States. He was working on introducing them and changing changing their their image too, how we saw them. And David Meech's studies shown that in the natural environment. It's very different from what you see in a captive environment with a bunch of wolves just thrown together, right? The, a bunch of unrelated adult wolves thrown together is the equivalent of like throwing a bunch of people together in a, in a concentration camp or something or something like that. Or you can imagine yourself just thrown together with a bunch of random, um, random adults and, and no way to separate from, you know, from each other and that's your your life a bunch of adult and adult women living together in a captive environment which is very different when you have wolves in their natural environment where they are not battling it out as much as you would see in captivity it's mostly made of family units so it's mostly made of family units of uh, a breeding pair and they have their and the breeding pair meet by by removing themselves for their own packs that they were raised they find the mate they make their own pups their their pups become yearlings and then they usually have a second litter and it's it's a family unit and there's not a lot of fighting going on there right the 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 alpha status or the 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 head dominant wolf status is mostly inherited the same way that parents do all right the same way that parents do so the fact that there's not a lot of violence within a wolf pack contradicted what was seen in Shankel study. But in no way did it make what Shankel observed untrue. It was objective. What Shankel was describing was true in that environment. And that's significant when we're talking about dog training which we often have on natural environments. And we need to understand what certain behaviors are for. And it also helps us by looking at Meech's work, it often even shows us the solution, all right? What works in a natural environment 
that makes aggression less likely and why aggression in some certain captive environments is more likely. So it's significant. Like Schenkel's work is nothing bad, all right? It's nothing that should be thrown out at all. It's, it's very, very important work. But what happened is Meech, he started saying things about the term alpha because people were using alpha. And he wrote his, um, I have, I'll jump ahead over here. Might as well bounce around, right? You'll see I have a list of significant things to, to look at. And I have a link over here and I have David Meech's studies. And this will pretty much sum it up. I mean, if you want to jump ahead and not dive into all these, over here I have um, Meech's explanation of the term alpha and the wolf packs. Very important. If you have any trouble downloading any links on here, don't just click on this. I'm getting some kind of weird, I have to troubleshoot something. Hopefully this problem will be fixed soon. If I, at least on mine, if I just click on it, it says a server error from the same window. Right click on it, just open it up in a new tab. Um, or copy link address and put it somewhere else and then it, and then it pops up. Then it pops up, all right? Um, read his own words, all right? Read, read his own words, um, but, uh-oh. But what he was trying right. to do, as a jingle guy. Mythology, mythology, <laughs> if today's part of, no <laughs> mythology. So, <laughs> no apology. <laughs> what is if today's stream Sorry, is too guys. long or too short. All right. <laughs> so what he was trying to do was soften the view of um of wolves and there was a lot of semantics really where in reality the term alpha is not really a bad term and in many ways it's really correct it was just he was trying to change the way people thought of wolves and as a matter of fact even when you go through his work and we see all the things that he said about um, that he says about alpha is not a correct term. If we go into more recent studies over here, you don't have to go into these, but just to give you examples, if we remove ourselves from the world of dog training, um, and here's some more recent ones. This one's from 2018. They use the word alpha. The scientists continue using the word alpha to explain to explain wolves all right like it, it never went away it's it's not it's not removed at all dominant alpha it's it, it's there it's very significant um so don't worry there's going to be some things that you read on the internet about dominance no longer exists and alpha uh, and, and alpha the whole idea of alpha wolves has been debunked it has not been debunked just read the source material read david meech's own words nowhere has he ever completely debunked the idea he may be just if anything he probably should have just left the term alone in, in my in my opinion um it wouldn't have done anything i think it's done more harm than good him playing around with uh with the terminology let me see what you guys are, are saying over here um, okay, good. You guys are sharing, sharing some stuff. Okay, let's get back. I jumped all over the place on my, on my stream here. Let's get back to where I was. Where was I? My little PowerPoint here. I don't think there's much over here. Um, okay, talking about David Meech. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, click through all this stuff. Sure is an easier way. All right. So, so David Meech, we're going to have him in the article. So he, he for sure has um, the most useful articles when it comes to studying their wild behavior. Um, it's a gold mine. Basically, it's a gold mine of information. Unfortunately, um, there's this whole word alpha which my advice to you is just don't read, 
don't read rhetoric on the internet about alpha is stick to the studies. If you stick to the studies, stick to stick to Meech's own words, stick to Shankle's own words, and you're not going to have a problem. Is after you read their words, the false and skewed information is just going to stick out like a sore thumb to you, basically. All right. So I'm making this easier for you guys to know the real information and to be able to form your own opinion and not rely on rhetoric at all. Now, by us studying, researching ethology and reading these studies that I'm going to have you read, it's not that many of them, and I will help you decipher them because um, some of the reading is not that easy, even for me, um, is there's all kinds of things here, right? Like we're going to learn about what an, what is the natural pack structure of canines. It's going to help understand what's going on with anyone that owns more than one dog. And often what's going on between the dog and the humans inside the household. But Remember, we as dog trainers, it's not about just teaching obedience. It's not even just about preventing aggression towards people, dogs towards people. We are often dealing with issues, dog on dog issues, not only outside of the home, but within the home. So you need to understand this if you want to be successful with your plans. Dominance, dynamics. You need to understand dynamics. Dominance is center. It's front and center when it comes to any sort of conflict within species. And often between different species, it is well documented that animals can have relationships with animals of different species and relate to them and also fight over things like resources and things like this. We need to understand dominance dynamics. It is well documented. It is there. And you will see why it is so unethical for certain organizations or, or, or people that have large followings to just say dominance is insignificant when it comes to dog training. Right? It's unethical. If we believe that and we teach that, then there would be no need to study this stuff. But pr I promise you, if you study this stuff, you are going to be so much more successful. Leadership. You're going to learn what leadership really is. Real leadership. And it's different from dominance. Marking behavior. We're going to really unlock by reading these studies. We're going to much. We're going to have a much clearer understanding of marking behavior. So not only is this going to help us with housebreaking issues, it can help us with aggression issues, resource guarding, dogs that are guarding food or objects in their ownership zone. We need to understand there's a difference. This is not the same as dominance or or dogs that are there's there's a reason for every behavior. And if we understand it and not only understand what it is, we need to understand what it is not before we can make a plan that makes sense. If we work with Mother Nature, the plans stick. We don't ever want to fight Mother Nature. We don't ever want to fight, mo fight mo Mother Nature. Territorial aggression, right? This is one of the most aggressive, deadliest types of aggression there is, is territorial aggression. But we got to understand it. It's unlocked by going into their ethology. Protection of the pack. Again, this is all different. It's there. It is there, the rationale, the reason, when it happens, understanding it, important. It's important to recognize it 
It's important information to know if you're doing protection dogs. It's all in the all in the ethology. It just goes on and on. Dispersal, Roman behavior with 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 dogs. Um, um, all this stuff is covered in the ethology. So, this is some the things that. I would suggest you to read to get a head start. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bounce away from the PowerPoint here. All right, here on that link. Remember, you're going to have to right click and open in a new tab, unfortunately. Um, it may work on your browser. I'm not sure what's happening on mine. The studies are there. If you're having trouble, download it. Just like right click it or something and you should be able to get it. What I put here is we have... Rudolf Schenkel studies, but I couldn't put these. It's just too much information to put in one stream. So we're going to, we're going to break it up. Um, I'll break these down for you, but if you want to jump ahead, I suggest everyone read, read these, um, expression studies of wolves. I have this here. I have actually, um, if you go to here, if you click on it, I've actually embedded it. Um, I, this is my writing. You can read this. Um, but if you click on, if you're on a desktop, you click here. It also makes it much easier to read because it's embedded. This I got from David Meech's site. And um, it seems like it even has his notes in there. It's the only copy I could find anywhere anywhere for us to for us to read which is a crime so um i believe i didn't do anything illegal by taking it and i put it into archive.org and which is cool i put this in a couple of years ago and i already seen other websites like link into this um so so this is good this information should be out there for people to know what it is and there's some great information in here um we also have some other ones that we're going to talk about. He had another, which he did like 20 years after that one on submission. Um, and this is interesting one too, which I, which I do want to go over. We have Meech. I put over here, I put six articles from him over here. Um, groundbreaking, a lot of these. Alpha status, dominance, and division of labor in the wolf pack. This is for sure, this is the one that's misquoted all the time. A lot of good information in here. And there's a lot of rhetoric where people just pass on and twist like a couple of sentences in there and ignore, ignore the rest of it. But great groundbreaking study. Leadership in wolf. Um... Um, this one, leadership behavior in relation to dominance and reproduction status, prolonged intensive dominance behavior between gray wolves. Keep in mind, this one's in 2010 by David Meech after supposedly dominance was debunked by him, right? So he's still writing about it. So um, here, this is a good one to start off with. This isn't really a study. It's just his explanation of the term alpha in wolf packs which I think he should have left it alone. That's my, that's my opinion. I believe he believes he should have left it alone too, according to some quotes that are out there. Um, but at least you can get the words from his mouth and not the cherry picked sentences that you see out there. And this one, he was, um, he was part of this study. I have this over group composition effects of, of aggressive interpack interrelation of gray wolves and Yellowstone national national park so these are all great studies um i also have here these are separate ones that were not they're not by um rudolf shankel or david meach but i thought they were significant for ethology some of these are a little bit more more modern actually uh let's see we got dominance relationships in a family pack of captive arctic wolves this one's going to be important. Um, um, it does help to clarify and give us a source to information 
mostly about preventing aggression within our own household of dogs. Um, but we'll go over this. So I'm not going to flood your brains right now with too much information for this stream. Um, this one, this is great study. This was, yeah, this one's 2018. It was a study about the play behavior in wolves and how it relates to dominance. And I love this study because it clarifies things. Sometimes when you're just doing something for enough time and you do it because it works and it seems almost like common sense, it is really cool to see that there was a study upon it. That study is that there was an objective study watching wolves play with each other. Not only watching wolves of the same um, the same age play with each other, younger wolves playing with older wolves, and how that related to, to dominance, basically, and how through play to a degree that it can take the place of actually fighting um, or solving conflicts about dominance or being able to feel each other out. And also how when there is definitely more of a set hierarchy, you can it's reflected within the rules of the play and stuff like that. It's very interesting and it's very significant um, for clarifying to ourselves why it is important to teach owners how to play properly with their dogs and how it helps with the relationship. And I love it because way before that study came out, that's what I was using. When I had, when I was taking new dogs, even into my in kennel program that I had to form a relationship with them, I never had to fight with these dogs. I mostly established my relationship, believe it or not, through play, through, through, through leadership and through, through play. Uh, so I love that. I love that study, but this is the source information. All right. Don't worry about how we're dealing with the, the client dogs just yet. If you have, I promise you, this is why it's called foundation style dog training. If you go, if you dig down to the roots, to the source of this behavior, it, it makes it so much easier when we're dealing with the, with the domesticated dogs. It's right in front of your face. It's right in front of your face. Like once you go to the to the roots, it's it's much clearer to 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 see it in domesticated dogs. Um, we also had I had this one too here: territorial and interpack aggression in in gray wolves. I put that one too, which talks a lot about territorial aggression and 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 stuff like that. But that's what you can read. So that's what we got for. For today's class, remember this will, some of you are watching the replay, depending how far in the future, this may already be embedded within a course. Um, this eventually is going to be part of the ethology module and it is meant to be an introduction. Don't be overwhelmed by all these studies because we are going to break these apart and I am going to tell you what I believe are the most important parts of the study, but I encourage you to be your own advocate for your information. Don't believe anyone's rhetoric, including mine. Go to the source information. Be, be an expert. Understand canine behavior. Do not mimic what anyone tells you to do. Again, including me. Understand it. So... I'll stay on for just like another minute to see if there are any big questions that I should answer before I shut this stream off. Otherwise, I can ans I will answer questions when I come back for the Q&A. If anyone is watching this replay, any questions about any of this course can always, the questions could always be asked in our live Q&As that we that we we do so i know there's a delay when i do a live stream so i'm just gonna hang out for a minute to see if there's anything here before i tell everyone to enjoy the rest of their their weekend yeah and that go 
over here. And you will find, I did put, um, you know, for now, it'll be, it's going to be in courseware, but at this date that I'm filming it, at least, you can find, you'll be able to find this replay. I'm going to put it in the 5.0 course over here. And it's over here. It's going to be the, in the ethology intro over here. All right. Looks like it's good. All right, looks like uh, no questions. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna get going. Thank you, everybody. I will be back Wednesday for live Q and A, and back Saturday to start our next unit.